You are now tuned into the Black Law Students Association of Canada's YouTube. Good evening, Justices. My name is Shayla Klein, and along with my co-counsel, Kevin Lee, I represent the appellant, Mr. Jamal Williams, in this matter. I have three submissions for you today. First, it is the appellant's position that the minister's failure to collect race-based desegregated data pertaining to COVID-19 infringes his life, liberty, and security of the person under Section 7 of the Charter. Mr. Williams is at a greater risk of serious complications from COVID-19 due to his membership in an enumerated group. Second, this failure further infringes his right to equality under Section 15 of the Charter. And third, that neither of these infringements can be justified under Section 1. I'll begin with a very brief overview of the case. This case is an appeal of the decision of Justice Brown at the Supreme Court of Canada, which wrongfully determined that the respondent, the Minister of Health, did not infringe my client's rights under Section 7 and Section 15 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms by failing to collect race-based desegregated data during the COVID-19 pandemic. This case is about systemic racism and the failure of the health system to acknowledge and care for the needs of a disadvantaged group during an uncertain time. Data collected from other jurisdictions during COVID-19 and data collected within Canada during other recent health crises, such as the H1N1 virus, show that Black Canadians are more at risk of contracting COVID-19 and also more likely to require intensive care and suffer serious, serious consequences, including death. The primary purpose of identifying racial disparities is to show the need to search for the underlying cause that can then become the focus of public health initiatives. Without the information to prove disparities, we cannot address them. On one hand, the minister is saying that they're doing the best thing for Canadians. But on the other hand, there's no data to back that statement up. This, state, this suggests an adverse inference that the minister is not collecting this information as doing so may actually show the opposite. Before continuing with my submissions, I must remind the court that everything considering the charter is to be interpreted broadly and purposively. Charter claims are given large and liberal interpretations in favor of the claimant. I remind the justices that Canadian doctrine and precedent are only persuasive and not binding at the Diversity High Court of Canada. Therefore, it is important to note that dissenting reasons may be give, given equal importance as majority judgments. In Council, state, I have a question before you get too much further, just so that I understand your position based on what you just said, not the, the other uh, the, the persuasiveness persuasiveness of the sense, but the um, just your position generally. Am mm -hmm. I right then that you agree that there isn't evidence that Mr. Williams is being discriminated against or that he is adversely impacted in Canada, but rather that there's simply an absence of data on that issue? Are you saying this goes further, that there should be an inference drawn because there's no data that he is in fact being adversely impacted? Uh, so sort of both. Um, we, we do have data from other jurisdictions um, that are similar to Canada facing similar experiences that do show a strong indication that Mr. Williams is adversely affected. Uh, however, you're right. Uh, we are agreeing that there, there is no direct discrimination. There's, there's no legislation that is causing uh, this, a discriminatory effect, nothing um, that's active. In fact, this is more uh, an issue of a lack of action. Does that answer your question, Justice Card? Yeah, for now, thank you. Um, I, I wanna continue on that line of analysis. You're saying there's no direct discrimination. What, what do you mean by direct discrimination? Uh, what I mean is that there, there is not a piece of legislation or statute that is specifically at question here uh, that is denying my client a right, but rather an omission. Uh, are there other forms of discrimination other than direct? that you may be raising? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we, we are saying uh, or, or raising the issue more uh, of indirect discrimination so that by failing to consider uh, my client and, and Black Canadians in the policy framework related to COVID-19, it's causing an adverse impact on these individuals. So it's not a direct action, but indirect. But, but what is that adverse impact? That adverse impact? So uh, that sorry, to understand that which adverse impact that my client is facing. Right, I think you just said that because there's a failure to collect data, your client or other black Canadians are suffering 
an adverse impact, not just that they might be, or the government can't prove that they're not, but I think you said that they actually are suffering an adverse impact. And if I do understand you correctly, what is that impact? Okay, uh, so it, excuse me, actually, it, it would be more the opposite to the first thing. Uh, so I might have misspoke there, um, but that we were suggesting that there, there is a lot of evidence to show that they are likely suffering an adverse impact and that it is not difficult for the government to collect this information and we would like to see it collected uh, to, to show that, that there, there is an adverse impact and then address, address those concerns uh, and that we can't make real imp impacts in policy without that information. Couldn't we argue that the absence of information is itself a tangible harm? Uh, absolutely. And, and I would go along that line that inaction is really an action and not making a decision isn't a decision as well. So um, by not doing something, it, it, it could be considered tangible. For example, uh, later in, and you would have read in my factum, I will discuss um, right to uh, liberty and, and related to bodily autonomy. And I would, I would pr put to you that Mr. Williams cannot make informed decisions about his personal autonomy and his personal health without fully informed information. And, and it's the government's responsibility and the minister's health responsibility to provide that information to him. Okay, so you, you wanna continue in your submissions? Thank you. So in this decision, or in this case, we're asking you to adopt the decision of the dissent written by Justice Martin. And I'd also like to remind the court that even the Supreme Court was split on this case with the majority only nearly reached and four justices agreeing with the dissent. It's the appellant's position that the collection of public health data is more than a political decision. A positive obligation can be imposed on the minister and collecting such data would not harm but further racial justice goals. The respondents claim that the collection of public health data is solely a political decision should be cast aside. The charter naturally gives rise to a more dynamic interaction among the branches of government, meaning that it is not the sole duty of the legislature to remedy an issue in silo. The judicial branch plays an important role in protecting these values and applying the charter in relation to government actions or omissions. And section 32.1b of the charter states that it applies to all matters within the authority of the legislature and does not suggest that a positive act is required. And as we've said, there is no specific positive act here, no specific policy that is actively discriminating, but rather an omission and, and a gap in the policy. In Wren, the Supreme Court left the door open for the court to consider government omissions. They held that the charter applies to both government actions and inactions and the discriminating effects of a gap in legislation. And I, I want to interrupt you there. So the, the Vreend or Vrend argument I find quite interesting. It, is, it, is it precise to say that the court in Vrend or Vreend, I'm not sure, uh, said that omissions are subject to scrutiny? And if, if so, where in Vrend does the decision say that specifically? Uh, one moment. Uh, I have the uh, the excerpt, but I but not the paragraph for you. I apologize. Uh, if you can read out the quote, I I will trust that the council is not misleading the court. Uh, but I'm just curious about what language the court used and if it specifically said that omissions are covered. Because Rend, as I understand it, is a case where there was legislation passed, which was then under-inclusive, which I think could be characterized as different from a categorical omission. So I'm curious uh, about what the excerpt says in relation to omissions per se. Uh, yes, so um, I believe, actually in here, and I have the paragraph for you. So paragraph 116. Uh, so it's written that often the objective of an omission is discernible from the act as a whole. Where it is not, one can look to the effects of an omission. Even if I were to pull the evidentiary burden aside and attempt to discover an objective for omission from the, sorry, and I'll, I'll skip maybe perhaps to the, Actually, I think even that's enough. So what I'm, curi what I'm curious about is, so it sounds like this is referring to an omission in relation to legislation. 
Yes. And do we and have something analogous here? Is there like a related legislation that we're talking about here that we can anchor that omission in? Uh, not quite, which is specifically why we're, we're coming here today and we're kind of asking for advice on that matter because there isn't really precedent dealing with a full a full omission, not, not like you said, just uh, under considering a specific group, but there's still sort of legislation like rent had legislation, but missed out on a, on a factor. There isn't um, a case that, that we have found uh, that does meet that. And in rent, they mentioned that as well. Uh, and, and essentially that's what I'm, I'm saying. The door was left open to consider that and it, it hasn't fully been decided one way or the other. And that's why, uh, part, partially why we're here today to discuss that issue. So this is an, you, you would admit this is an extension of rent? An extension, yes. And not specifically analogous, uh, an extension. Continue. The appellant submits by not creating any kind of policy or program that considers the effect of race during COVID-19, the respondent is doing a greater disservice to disadvantaged Canadians by failing to consider them at all. My friends submit that mandating the data collection is only a decision for the legislature and not for the courts to consider. I submit to you that that is wrong. The charter invites dialogue between parliament and the courts. It is the court's purpose to preserve rights of Canadians, but perhaps most importantly, the rights of minorities, which are often trampled on and forgotten in policy. Historically, the way that inequalities like these are resolved is to come to the courts, to come here. This is what the courts do, and you help people who are on the fringes who may be disregarded in the policy. Further, this specific court, the Diversity High Court of Canada, is designed even more with this purpose in mind. You safeguard diversity and the protections owed to minorities, and that's why we're here today. So, to piggyback on our on our last conversation here, uh, there there is no, uh, as we've said, there's no specific piece of legislation, and we are a bit in the gray area here as to a total omission of the government to take an action. Uh, but that's why we're here today, and it's specifically why we're turning to the courts to help us with that matter. But there is an an action, though, isn't there? I mean, your argument includes the fact that the government is collecting data, correct? Yes, the government is collecting data, uh, including data uh, gender, on gender age. and age, yes. Right, and so that is an action. It may not be connected to legislation per se. Mm -hmm. Presumably it's pursuant to legislation, right? But my first question is, that that's, a, that's an action, isn't it? Yes, certainly. Okay. Um, would your claim be available? Would you be making this claim if the government wasn't collecting any data at all? Not uh, age, not gender, not neighborhood, that kind of thing. Uh, I certainly, I think so. I think it would be a much broader claim, uh, however. In other words, is it that the government has cho chosen to take an action, but in doing so, it's, are you, you're saying it's a discriminatory, discriminatory action against your client and other Black Canadians? Yes, that they're that the action that they have taken. So, for example, uh, the self-assessment tests that are common in most of the provinces, where uh, citizens can um, do a quiz on a number of factors to determine if they should go get tested for COVID, um, doesn't include race. And uh, by failing to do that, they are discriminating against that group by not collecting that information. We can't create specific programs such as additional. Um, like additional testing centers in neighborhoods where there's a higher black population or the provision of free masks or uh, things like that. We can't take those actions. So yes, I, I would agree with that. Hmm. Yeah, and I don't wanna take you too far afield from your submissions, but I just wanna really wrap my head around this issue because I think it's central to your argument and certainly your friend's argument. I imagine in response that this is a political decision and we need to allow this balancing to the, to the government. Mm -hmm. um, which is if the government, like where, where does the line drawn in terms of when an individual can bring a claim in terms of how the government sets its priorities? Um, if, if they weren't collecting data at all, would, would the claim still be that it's discrimination against black Canadians? Um, like how would that play out? Or, or at one point, does there come a point where it's like, well, that's a government decision and 
it's it's not up for the courts to tell them to even act in the first place. Mm -hmm. And and we would agree that the government and the minister in this situation is owed some deference, uh, but that that deference has a reasonable limit and that we to say simply that this is an emergency and the minister has to act to the best he sees fit is not really sufficient one year into the pandemic. And it is hard to say what would happen if we had no data collection at all. But in this case, we we do have data collection, and like I like my factum refers to uh, in the H1N1 crisis, we did collect this information, and it did show an adverse impact for Black Canadians. So to turn a face to that and ignore it and not collect any information here, or, or even knowing those previous uh, previous discrepancies, not create any specific programs, is is certainly we, we would say irresponsible and and failing to consider them. Isn't the collection of gender and age data, but not race data? Uh, aren't, isn't this exactly Vrend? You, you, you said that we're extending into Vrend, but if we're collecting gender and age data, but not race data, I, I don't, I fail to see how it's not on all fours with Vrend. It seems to me that one's about legislation and one's about a policy decision, as Justice Garg said, likely under legislation, but it sounds like this is quite similar, actually. Yeah, and that's exactly, um, I guess, ex what you last said about uh, it being a policy decision versus a legislative decision was was more what I was getting at with it being an extension of REN because it's not specifically legislated for and it is more the the policy and the, the softer law. Feel free to proceed. Uh, so I'll now discuss the section seven infringement in some more detail. So for reference, you may return to paragraph nine of my factum. Uh, section seven involves a two-step analysis. Is step one asking if there is an infringement of one of the three protected interests, a deprivation of life, liberty, or security of the person? And section two asking if that deprivation is in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. To prove a section seven infringement, the claimant must show a causal connection between the government's action or omission and the harm to the applicant. So here the minister is responsible for overseeing the formulation of health policy and setting standards for the delivery of health care and providing strategic decisions. And I'm, I ask you, where can Mr. Williams turn if not the public health system over which the minister is presiding? And it's absurd and overreaching for the respondent to claim that without this information, there would be no change to the number of people contracting, suffering complications from and dying from COVID-19. We, we can't make that claim because we don't have the data to support it. So to say that there is no difference is as simple as saying that there would be a difference, which we also can't quite claim because we don't have that information. Uh, so the SEC states in Carter in Canada at paragraph 62 uh, that the right to life is engaged when there is an increased risk of death and that that's quite uh, quite what we're we're facing in this situation. The minister's inaction seriously and negatively affects Mr. Williams' life as he is at greater risk, most likely based on the, the uh, inf other information we have from other jurisdictions of contracting COVID-19 and also at a greater risk of serious complications. Uh, but you do say that you did agree that we can't say there is an actual difference for Mr. Williams, is that fair? I would say it is fair to say that we can't um, concretely say, but we do have a, a wealth of information to show that there is a strong likelihood that it is that case. And that's because of studies in other jurisdictions, you say? Studies in other jurisdictions, so including the United Kingdom and the United States, uh, as well as information that we have on, on past health crises in Canada. Okay. So the right to life includes access to medical care, protection from state imposed psychological, psych, psych, psychological dis, distress, access to medical treatments and conditions endangering life and health. I ask the court to pause and carefully consider the wording of the case law here. The SEC has ruled that citizens should be protected from these physical and mental health risks and protection is a preliminary response. It is cautionary, a defense, a safeguard. It is not reactionary or done after the fact. And to only retrospectively act on a foreseeable and preventable life that threatening virus is entirely irresponsible and far too late. Without the statistical data, the minister is irrationally refusing to collect. The government and health authorities are blind when implementing any policies that will actually make a difference for disadvantaged groups during the pandemic. Is the refusal to collect irrational? or is it motivated by concerns about the resources that would be required in collecting that data? Uh, 
I would argue that it's irrational and, and in question or to your point about it being about resources, uh, as, as we say in, in the section one argument further in our, into our factum, uh, it, it's not very difficult in, in terms of allocating resources. Like we've said, it's a, it's a questionnaire online that's self-reported. How difficult is it to add another question? Uh, and a simple response and and further uh, to to Justice Brown's uh, argument in uh, in his decision uh, that doing so may affect privacy rights or or may uh, actually adversely affect Black Canadians by increasing stereotyping. We say that this is this is really going too far because it, we're not forcing or asking that individuals be forced to report on their race, but simply that we'd like to collect this information. And, and there's, a, there's a simple answer to that too. You can, you can offer a prefer not to say. Uh, so it, I, I would say that it's, it's not about resources. It, it, doesn't, it shouldn't be very hard to add another question on a, on a questionnaire and you can offer a prefer not to say. What you have to do with that information later may be about resources, uh, maybe about where to direct them and how many you have and how much you need, but that data would then show you where, where to better direct your, your resources. So essentially we're saying here that the leadership is acting blindly because they don't have this information. And if the leadership is blind, so too are the people. For Mr. Williams and other members of his class are not being able to make a fully informed decision of the impending threats they face and cannot make it a autonomous personal health decisions to care for themselves. So of course, Mr. Williams and, and most Canadians, I, I say that it's agreed, know about the risks of COVID-19. They've been told wear a mask, they've been told stay home if you're sick. But a lot of these decisions are still subjective and they fall along a line of, of when you're going to take action. So for example, if, if you have a bit of a cough, choosing to stay home or to go to work, you need to some factors that help you make that decision and weigh in. And hearing that I'm specifically at a greater risk would probably make me more cautious and stay at home, but, but we're not giving them that information. So what we'd like to propose and, and kind of getting into remedies a bit um, would be to refer this back to the minister and give him a reasonable time to create policy. We're not asking the court to create policy. We're simply asking them or asking you to refer it back to him and say that or her and say that uh, she create policy about this in a reasonable time, allow her the best way with her expertise to do so. And then perhaps with that information later, there would be uh, additional testing centers, treatment centers in areas or communities where the virus uh, is increasing uh, or in black communities and, uh, and additional measures. But, but that would be up entirely to the minister. Well, let me ask you about that then, um, because you're, you're mentioning that there's other ways, you know, steps that could be taken, I assume, because of the data. But when we're assessing the, this claim, which fundamentally comes down to discrimination, right? Um, do we consider other ways that the government is addressing COVID that is uh, sensitive and, and considers uh, race issues and the issues of racialized Canadians? Um, or do we only look at this in isolation? So for example, and this is hypothetical, I'm not saying that we have access to this, these facts, but if for example, uh, the government is taking actions in its vaccination rollout, for example, or in providing benefits through uh, the wage subsidy and serve and things of those nature. And if those have been shown to consider um, race, can that kind of offset? Or in other words, should we be looking at it globally or do we look at it in isolation? So I, I, I'm not sure if it would offset it. I think that the vaccination example is, is excellent. So the minister is already showing that there's a need to prioritize minority peoples um, in COVID policy like vaccination uh, that's placing a high degree of priority on indigenous peoples on reserves. Uh, and, and we'd say that that is the minister agreeing and, and showing that there is an importance to consider racial minorities that are historically disadvantaged in our healthcare system, but yet he's failing to include others and, and we don't understand why. And so that's really the crux of this, this discrimination claim and, and, and really further down to the section 15 argument that this is unequal and unclear and that we'd ask for additional guidance. Uh, so I, I see the here that I'm, uh, I'm running close on time. So I'll have to re rely on my factum for the remainder of my submissions, unless there's additional questions that I can answer for you, uh, that will be the remainder of my submissions today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.
now hear from the uh, second counsel for the appellant. Thank you. Hello, justices. My submissions today are those arguments of the appellant, Mr. Jamal Andrew Williams, which are based in theory. Justices, the COVID-19 pandemic has tested us all. In some ways, it has been a great equalizer, requiring us all to take the same collective action to fight the transmission of the disease. But in other ways, it has instead amplified existing inequalities. Statistics from the US Center for Disease Control show that Black Americans are more than four times likely to require hospitalization for COVID-19 than our white Americans and are more than twice as likely to die. These statistics are appalling. They are a call to action. The respondent has refused to even collect the equivalent statistics in Canada. But this appeal, this appeal is about much more than data. It is fundamentally about race. The respondent's failure to take any action whatsoever to specifically help Black Can Canadians through this unprecedented pandemic is symptomatic and symbolic of the way that racial inequality is propagated in the modern age. The respondent wishes to pass off colorblind policy as equality policy. My submissions today are informed by the work and insights of critical race theory. Critical race theory examines issues of race through a structural and institutional lens. The disproportionate effects of the pandemic on racialized people are the result of structural, institutional, and historical factors which existed in Canada long before COVID-19 reached our shores. Gone are the days when the law can afford to be blind to these factors and how they shape issues of race and law in this country. As the COVID-19 crisis has once again revealed, racial inequality is a matter of life and death. Thankfully, through this court, the Diversity High Court of Canada, we can take steps towards a better future of racial justice in this country. Through your oversight, Justices, we can correct the course of the law. Today, the appellant asks no less of you than to fundamentally rewrite aspects of our jurisprudence so that we might purge antiquated logic from our law books and move a little closer to the equality promised in the Charter. Today, we have an opportunity to reimagine problematic doctrines that have propagated harmful structures and take steps towards a world where the playing field is just a little bit more equal. Council, um, do we need to rewrite the jurisprudence for you to win in this case? Or are you proposing that in addition to the fact that perhaps Vreend might get you there already? Well, as we understand the purpose of this court, Justice, I am confident in my co-counsel submissions and the case law suggests that we can win on a constitutional argument. But I suggest that today is an important step in us being able to go farther and correct systemic issues and improve the law as we understand the purpose of this court to be. Does that answer, sir? Yes. Thank you. My submissions before you today will suggest three such Cana changes to Canadian law, three equality, member, equality measures grounded in critical race theory. First, that the doctrine of deference to parliament be abandoned in cases that deal with constitutional rights of racialized people. Second, that section 15 sub two of the charter should be read as imposing a duty on the government to take affirmative action towards racial equality when making broad policy decisions. Finally, the Oaks test, as it pertains at least to section seven and 15, should be modified to include the insights of critical race theory as an overriding guiding principle. So I have a question about the first one that I'm assuming you're gonna get into right now, which is the deference question. So I've looked at your factum and um, you know one of the things that you say is that the part of the reason deference shouldn't be shown is that Canada's, and this is paragraph 31 of your fact, and Canada's institutional balance is such that parliament represents the majority while the courts uphold and enforce minority rights. But 
what if the government can prove that it is advancing minority interest? What if, even though it's elected by ultimately a majority or a plurality, I suppose, of Canadians, um, but that the Canadians themselves, even if it's the majority, want their government to go above and beyond to advance minority interests. And that generally speaking, not just this case, but generally, that can be shown to be occurring. Why would we not show any deference to the government? Or in other words, why would we start from a presumption that they're not going to give effect to minority rights? It's a good question, Justice. I would characterize it this way. If the government can go above and beyond to show that it has been a guardian for minority rights, then it will easily win its case. It doesn't require us to remove the courts entirely from the decision-making process. If the, if the parliament can clearly show that it is acting as a guardian for minorities, then it can bypass the court's tests easily and should win. However, I, we suggest that it is a bridge too far to presume that they are the guardian of rights in these situations and remove the courts as a guardian entirely, that it removes a structural barrier from, uh, from the majority parliament. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, please continue. Thank you. The Supreme Court decision in Mr. Williams' case framed the issue as a balancing of rights between Mr. Williams' charter rights and possible anti-Black prejudice that might result from the data. This framing allowed the court to engage the doctrine of deference. I submit that the decision is illustrative of the problems with applying the doctrine of deference in minority rights cases in two ways. First, as I've discussed, it diminishes the, roles, the court's role as a guardian of rights. But second, and more importantly, it places Mr. Williams' fundamental charter rates at equal weight with misguided prejudice of those who would twist the data to serve a racist agenda. The majority states quote, perhaps confirmation that more black people have been impacted by COVID-19 will increase racial prejudice against those people who some will wrongly assume are the authors of their own misfortune, unquote. In so stating, the majority allows the government to restrict Mr. Williams' charter rights because the fact of black Canadians disproportionate harm from, from the pandemic will be misinterpreted to impute causation and fault on black Canadians themselves. It suggests that this data, data which can save lives or improve lives is somehow counterbalanced by basist racist twisting of facts. The appellant asks this court to reject the idea that this is an equal balance. Justice, both racial and legal, demands that the scale tip in favor of Mr. Williams' rights. Are you saying that these types of down the line concerns are constitutionally irrelevant? Or are you saying that they are outweighed by other concerns in this case? I would say that they are outweighed by other concerns in this case, uh, the, the concerns that I've stated. Okay and significantly outweighed. My second proposed equality measure today, found at page 13 of our factum, relates to section 15 sub two of the charter. In short, the appellant submits that this section has been interpreted too narrowly and that this interpretation has resulted in an artificially low standard for the Canadian government to meet on issues of equality. The respondent and the Supreme Court majority base their position on charter application in part on the distinction between action and inaction. The appellant proposes that this distinction be overtaken by recognizing a positive duty on the government to take affirmative action when making policy that affects the Canadian population at large. Council, is the Fraser and Canada decision referred to in your materials? Uh, no, Justice, not in my materials. Are you familiar with the Fraser v. Canada decision? I'm sorry, sir. No, I'm not. That's absolutely all right. Um, but you might want to take a look at it uh, after this appeal, because there might be some nice language in there in terms of positive obligations. But please continue. Thank you. <clears throat> the respondent disagrees that there is a positive duty to consider race when making policy. The respondent, at page 15 of their factum, characterizes collecting the data requested by the appellant as a race-based approach to healthcare. Respectfully, the appellant disagrees 
and submits that the minister's approach to the pandemic has been everything except race-based approach. The appellant merely asks the minister, add race to the long list of factors on which data is being actively collected, including gender, age, and medical history. As Alan Fremont and Nicole Lurie write, tracking the racial and ethnic composition and changing healthcare needs of, the popul of different populations is vital if our healthcare system is to fulfill its essential functions. Our proposed reinterpretation- Who are the two people that you just named? Uh, Alan Fremont and Nicole Lurie. Do you know who are they? Uh, they're scholars in the area of uh, uh, medical racism. Thanks. They were included in uh, your materials, Justice. <laughs> <laughs> Just testing you. <laughs> Our proposed reinterpretation of this section enhances racial equ equality by demanding affirmative action. Critical race scholars Kevin Brown and Daryl Jackson write that when the Supreme Court held affirmative action policies to be a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, the civil rights progress that began with Brown versus Board of Education was halted in its tracks. Affirmative action compels us to take positive steps away from the unequal world of today. Council, I have a question. So I appreciate the difference between doctrine and theory. However, how far are you saying that theoretical arguments, including critical race theory can go. We don't have to you know, confine ourselves to how we understand legal arguments to normally be made, but are we still stuck with the precise wording of the charter, for example? Not necessarily, Justice, but the remedy that we're suggesting is found within the, the confines of the language of the charter. And to some extent, in, as a tiebreaker, to so to say, it's preferable probably to leave things as close to jurisprudence as they are. Though critical race theory, we would suggest, is certainly justified in taking it farther if necessary. We're suggesting an incremental step. So then my follow-up question is this. Like when I look at section 15, sub one and sub two, I mean, a plain reading of sub two appears to be that it's, it's sort of an exception to sub one, that you can't consider sub two sort of just on its own, but rather you look at an action and it might be considered to run afoul of sub one, but it wouldn't if it falls within sub two. But when I read your factum and the second point that you're building on right now, it seems to be we should read sub two in a different way. But are, are you gonna ask us to read it in a way that's inconsistent with its plain reading? Well, we would suggest certainly that, first of all, that there may not be a plain reading of the charter. And I would disagree with you at least to that respect. It has to be considered in its context. And as my colleague stated, it has to be given a purpose of interpretation. The purpose of this section was equality and it was introduced into a fundamentally unequal world. The only way that we submit that that section can be given effect is if it compels action to move away from inequality and towards equality. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> the we also not say that while 15.2 clarifies that affirmative action is not discriminatory, that that clarification does not necessarily limit the scope of how discrimination is itself defined. Yes, that could be said. If I understand your correct <laughs> question, sorry. <laughs> now, did you want me to expand on that? No, no, no. Just, I just was curious as to whether or not there's another way to look at it. Okay, thank you. The proposed interpretation of Section 15 sub 2 makes action non-optional. Equality will not be achieved any other way. As applied to the present case, the proposed interpretation renders moot the action versus inaction debate as it pertains to charter application. Inaction should not be a valid defense. We may not know the precise steps required to achieve racial equality, but the appellant submits that to do nothing is not the way. I move to the fi appellant's final equality measure found at page 15 of our factum. I have one more question. I, I appreciate the fuzzy boundary between action and inaction. Um, but I wonder if we're going to use courts as a vehicle for required action, how we, in a legal sense, identify a ceiling to what action is constitutionally sufficient 
it's certainly a valid question, Mr. Justice. And I'm not suggesting that we know the limits of this today, but what we are suggesting is that it is valid for the, the court to compel the minister to do more than zero. Exactly what the limits of what they can compel them to, we may not know at this time, but for now we can suffice to say that more than nothing is required. Thank you. I move to the appellant's final equality measure found at page 15 of our factum. We submit that the Oaks test, at least as it pertains to section seven and 15, should be modified to include the insights of critical race theory as an overriding guiding principle. The landmark case of Oaks was handed down in 1986. Counsel, many critical race theorists disagree with each other. It's no monolith. So what does it mean to bring in critical race theory in a broad sense? Critical race theorists actually will disagree about this very case. So I'm, I'm not sure um, what, you know, how you operationalize that. Certainly. Well, I can give you an example. Um, at paragraph four, the majority of the Supreme Court rhetorically asks for how many different races and the seemingly infinite combination thereof must the, connect, the minister collect such information. Justice, there are many competing ideas and certainly critical race theory is not a monolith, but there is no strain of critical race theory which would allow the majority to leave the definition of race undefined. It appears to endorse a definition of race that is based on an outdated definition of biological heritage. We're unclear what the majority means and that lack of clarity prevents us from actively and accurately assessing the mindset of the majority when assessing in this appeal. How exactly it manifests will, will change from case to case. And, but what we would like to do is invite that debate within critical race theory into the courtroom so that it can better our society. The point is that critical race theory lens over the majority decision and over the decision of our courts would demand <clears throat> that courts justify their definitions and assumptions. It would compel Canadian courts to challenge their own logic for outdated assumptions of how race operates in our world. Justices, in a few moments, my learned friends will address you as to the minister's position. But to the appellant, the respondent's factum raises more questions than answers. At page 16 of their factum, the respondent argues that collecting race-based data reduces individuals who experience an intersectional identity to a single access framework. We recognize the complexity of intersectionality, but question that this justifies collecting data on every single access of human identity, except for race. Furthermore, the appellant asks, where were the minister's concerns over oversimplistic self-identification when using data when she asked people to identify their gender? Also, the minister had no problem collecting and using patients' data on patients' individual me medical histories, data which can be easily as varied and complex as a person's racial identity. At page 20 of their factum, the respondent argues that empowering racial communities to collect health data avoids a number of issues of race-based data collection. We agree but suggest that that does not give the, the minister an excuse not to meet her constitutional obligations. Rather, the minister could have instead herself reached out to and given resources to racial communities so that race-based data collection, which was accomplished in so many other countries, could still be done here. The appellant submits that this approach could avoided, have avoided many of the issues that the respondent identifies around data collection including creating accountability and transparency over the minister and building trust within racialized communities. Council, we only have a couple minutes left, so let me ask you this question. If the government had collected race-based data, um, but let's say it was done very broadly, would you still be able to make a, a claim that the actual way that race is being delineated was not done, it was not done properly, for example, or so long as the government does something to collect race-based data, then you have no further complaint. As I said in my earlier answer, the exact scope of what the government has to do to meet this obligation is perhaps unclear at this time and on these facts, but it has to be more than nothing, certainly. 
as to whether we would be satisfied, that would have to be, it would be very set fact specific as to what was done and how I would suggest. The appellant calls on this court to fulfill its noble purpose, to correct the course of legal development in this country so that our promised equality can become that much more real. Justices, subject to your questions, that concludes my submissions. Thank, Thank you very much. We will now hear from the for, uh, first counsel for the respondent. Apologies, thank you, justices. Good evening, um, my name is Teresa James and my co-counsel Olivia Huen and I are representing the respondent this evening on this appeal. I'll begin by providing some context about the current uh, case. COVID-19 has already claimed the lives of over 20,000 Canadians and the pandemic is still ver remains very much an ongoing public health emergency, even a year out. In this context, the federal government has responded to an extraordinary and unprecedented level of demand and strain on federal resources, resulting in an expected $1 trillion deficit over the coming years. Much of the support has gone towards support for uh, the Minister's Health's urgent, time-sensitive, and direct responsive measures from testing, preventative measures, to treatment, and vaccines. Now, within this context, the appellant seeks to impose a further responsibility on the Minister of Health, which is the positive obligation to engage in race-based disaggregated data collection. Specifically, Mr. Williams alleges that the Minister has violated his Section 7 and 15 rights under the Charter by failing to collect this data. This appeal should be dismissed. In support of our position today, we have four arguments grounded in legal doctrine, as well as four grounded in critical race theory, or CRT. I will begin by addressing our first two legal submissions and my co-counsel Olivia will then continue with our remaining four, uh, remaining four arguments. Uh, rather, I will address our first two legal submissions and first two CRT submissions and then she will continue with the remaining four. So beginning with our first doctrinal argument, we submit that the charter claim against the minister is simply not justiciable. This is for three reasons. If you go from um, paragraph six of our factum, we discuss the fact that uh, data collection is ultimately a policy decision and one that should be left up to the legislators rather than for the courts to determine how to proceed. Council, when is discrimination not a policy decision? Pardon? When is discrimination not a policy issue? Um, I understand that discrimination can always involve policy decisions. Nevertheless, I, I, we submit that the nature of this decision falls within the policy realm of uh, the, government's, uh, the government's ability to make decisions to the extent that the courts should uh, appreciate and defer to the types of reasoning and institutional expertise that exists within uh, legislators and public decision makers who um, in a way different from the court, courts and the judiciary have access to uh, public consultation and local uh, community support for their policies. So is this argument about the character of the, uh, of the issue at stake or is it about the relative expertise of courts and governments? Uh, our, so essentially our position is that the, the relative expertise of governments and courts is important in understanding the nature of the issue at stake because in asserting that this uh, policy action or inaction uh, constitutes discrimination uh, the appellant is uh, 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 assume, making some assumptions that uh, essentially don't account for the, uh, the knowledge and the expertise that the governments themselves have. So while discrimination is obviously not something that would uh, be a legitimate policy, we submit that that discrimination is not um, actually uh, happening in this case and that uh, it, at least in the way that, it, that the claim is, has made it out to be. So in this sense, um, going further on this, uh, I point out that, you know, the, in the Williams v. Canada decision currently on appeal, Justice Martin framed the uh, data collection issue as just a question of whether or not the government is engaging in the activity and not a question about how the state provides public health care. 
Now, with respect, we submit that collecting race-based data goes very much to affecting how the government, um, uh, rather how the public has access to public health care services. As we'll discuss in our arguments to come, this happens in a variety of ways from reallocating scarce public health resources to potentially deterring the most racialized persons from accessing care. In this sense, we submit that the processes and consequences of data collection are actually much more complex and nuanced than it, it, it might at first seem, and it should not be oversimplified as a decision. We ask that this court recognize that the decision of the government in this particular situation during a global crisis to not collect data is very much a decision about how they want, how the government wants to provide services to the public. Do your friends say that we can just add a question to a questionnaire and that it's straightforward? Do you agree with that? We uh, strong, with respect, strongly disagree with our friend's position on that. And um, especially based drawing on a critical race theory perspective, we note that the complexity of race is uh, in many ways vastly more complex than things like age and gender. And recognizing that gender itself is also very complex and not uh, binary, we would note that in terms of adding questions to a survey, um, the, the reason that data, data exists already about age and gender, but not about race is because within provincial healthcare institutions, those institutions already have information about gender and age because of the way uh, public health uh, operates on those uh, elements. But we do not have a system where you have to uh, identify your racial uh, background or, uh, or, or your identity in order to access healthcare services because it doesn't, uh, it, to, to, to provide healthcare services in that way would perpetuate a very problematic biological approach to race um, that would essentialize racial identity in a way that is very, has a history of being really harmful for uh, black individuals, but racialized individuals in general. And moving you say, on. You say, uh, you said because of the way public health operates, um, but that's also the government's decision, right? So can, can we use how the government has historically and continues to administer public health as a shield to constitutional scrutiny in relation to its handling of COVID-19? Or does that only speak to the even graver scope and extent of this systemic discrimination? Uh, we, we agree that this, uh, the, the way the current system operates, of course, should not be used as a shield to constitutional scrutiny. Nevertheless, uh, what I meant by that is that uh, in order to provide healthcare services that are appropriate, age is often very relevant for medical reasons. Um, gender is a more complicated issue than age, but it is relevant in, to certain extents. Um, and uh, the way that age, that gender is captured in, in, in data systems can be debated, but because that's not an issue here, what we wanna focus on is the fact that race itself is a lot more complicated than that. How can you know? We move also to the oh. uh, the. Can you hear me, Council? Yeah. Okay. But how can you know if race is relevant to medical decisions if you're not collecting that data? So what and, we... and I'll, I'll jump off of that as well. Is, is there an authority that you refer to that talks about age and gender being relevant to medicine but not race? Um, I will refer to one authority not that doesn't specifically talk about the relevance of age and gender, but it does talk about the way that um, it's not that race is not relevant to how we understand healthcare services, but rather that uh, characterizing uh, the prevalence of certain medical conditions or uh, susceptibility uh, as directly related to race can be very problematic. As we discuss in our critical race theory uh, arguments, there's this, a, a high likelihood that collecting race-based data can perpetuate medical racism. And this happens as, according to uh, scholars like Dorothy E. Roberts, as well as Judith B. Kaplan, who uh, has done a lot of research on health policy, there is a really a problematic approach, a, a problematic consequence of a, a single access type of race-based approach to healthcare. And this is the reinforcement of the biological and uh, uh, understanding of race as opposed to the socially constructed uh, category of race. So the problem here is really that um, essentially if medical practitioners uh, adopt certain assumptions about a racialized individual based on the general preval prevalence, for example, if we have statistics it is from disaggregated data saying that 
Black Canadians are at a certain percentage risk or higher risk of a certain condition, there is this high risk and that has been documented in the research that practitioners tend to treat race itself as the cause of illness, rather than looking at the real proper symptoms and other appropriate factors. So this has been documented as extremely problematic, especially for Black patients who are more likely to face uh, problematic diagnoses and treatment because they don't get the same um, more thorough uh, di uh, approach to their care as the sort of white default patient that is uh, treated by these institutions. But will the collection of data necessarily have that play out or make that worse? I mean, for one, that may already be occurring regardless. And who knows, maybe the data will show that Black Canadians are less likely to be carrying COVID. I mean, we don't know because that's the issue. It is not being collected. Why would we start from an assumption that collecting race data will actually perpetuate racism by state actors on the ground? And, and, and continuing on that, I mean, I, th I definitely see your argument in the context of individual service providers. Um, being confronted with, you know, always making sure they know the race right before they have a meeting with someone. But I feel like that differs from, you know, perhaps anonymized data collection on a systems level to understand how COVID-19 is happening in Canada. Absolutely. Um, going, if going to the first point uh, from Justice Garg, I would suggest that uh, we don't know, of course, for sure that this will be the immediate consequence of uh, race-based disaggregated data collection. But the research has shown that it can and does happen, and it is a very high risk of engaging in this type of activity. So going on, uh, jumping back to the idea of it being a policy decision, this is the kind of risk of harm that the government needs to consider in making a policy decision that while the appellant raises, it could, raises the potential benefits of it, we can't ignore the fact that there's a very real risk of real harm to the very patients and persons that this type of policy would try to protect. And um, uh, sorry, if you do you, don't mind repeating the last uh, question, Justice oh, Harrington. I was just wondering how, you know, mechanically, if, if let's say the government collects data on COVID-19 infections, just that, um, disaggregated, anonymized race-based data. I'm wondering mechanically how that translates into, for example, individual service providers in the medical community stereotyping. To me, that sounds like it's sufficiently abstracted that it just lets us know the interface of racism with public health versus every, every patient having on their file their racial identity at the top line. I could see that you know, inculcating certain values in the medical profession as distinct from more systems level analysis and data collection. Um, so I'm just curious uh, about how that would mechanically happen, or if there are scholars arguing this, how they've articulated the ways in which that might happen. Absolutely. We would submit that um, even the anonymized uh, basic level data about the prevalence of, uh, of a condition among a certain race, for example, just a blanket statistic that, as an example, Black Canadians are X percentage more likely to suffer from certain condition or, or whatever other fact, that alone can in perpetuate these existing problematic practices among medical practitioners. Just knowing that and the fact that in consulting with patients, they often make assumptions or can perceive or estimate what one's race would be, although that might not be accurate, is a high likelihood that a perceived uh, identification of a patient's race could lead to these harmful outcomes. And now if it's- Is the okay, government I, gonna stop collecting any race-based data then? On other issues? I mean, the government does collect race-based data, doesn't it, in other areas of, of life? And this sounds like gender-based data could be reinforcing social norms in the health profession right. in relation to sexism. Right. So there's always a risk that the data could get misused. Is that a reason to not collect the data, to have the knowledge, and then make decisions from there? Absolutely. But if uh, I may address that uh, concern within the context of our Section 7 uh, argument as well. So in regards to the Section 7 uh, argument, we submit that this uh, Section 7 right is not violated by the, um, uh, by the minister's decision not to collect this data. So if I can explain our position on this uh, briefly, essentially, um, not only is there a, a strong jurisprudence uh, against a positive obligation under Section 7, but in addition, we argue that there's no causal link uh, 
between the potential harm to life, liberty, security of the person. What's, and the, what's the strong jurisprudence against a positive obligation under Section 7? So as a starting point, we look at decisions such as Gosselin v. Quebec, where the Supreme Court of Canada held in the majority uh, this part of the decision that the section of seven of the charter does not impose a positive obligation on the state to, to guarantee everyone's right to life, liberty, and security of the person. Now, obviously, understand that this decision was uh, intensely split, and the dissenting view is quite um, strong. Was McLaughlin, um, however, in, was McLaughlin in dissent in that case? That's um, the case with the open, right, the passage about the op leaving the open door for, for positive claims. Is that right? Um, yes, McLaughlin was, uh, was not in the dissent. She was in the majority? Yeah, did so did she write part. the majority? Because um, I, yeah. th I thought in that decision there was a passage specifically saying that the door was open later on for positive obligations. Isn't that right? Absolutely. And so... Yeah. Building from, so they, that statement was, uh, that I just mentioned was at paragraph 81, and they, they the majority also emphasized that the focus of section seven was restricting the state's ability to deprive life, liberty, security of the person. Now, obviously that passage was also that you just mentioned, leaving the door open to positive obligations was mentioned in Gus Lent. That, However, that just, it, it doesn't strike me as a strong jurisprudence against positive obligations if the court many years ago said that there's a possibility of positive obligations in the future. Absolutely. So we, I agree that this case on its own is not a strong, that strong jurisprudence, but we, what we note is that it was, it was almost 20 years ago now that this case came out noting, opening this potentially very wide door to positive obligations. And since then, no court in Canada has found that there is this type of positive obligation under section seven. So what I mean by the strong jurisprudence on this point is really about the fact that um, many, many courts across Canada, the Supreme Court, appellate courts, lower courts across the country, in many contexts have been faced, have had these the section seven claims raised on many different issues, such as related to economic rights and other non-administration of justice contexts. And they have continuously rejected um, a, a finding that there was a section seven positive obligation owed. Now, of course, this um, is all based on the specific facts of each of those cases, but we submit that this consistent approach across uh, courtrooms in the country over 20 years suggests that this, this issue has been considered and the reasons given in all of these cases is quite well-founded in terms of how the section seven operates and the, the way that that door could potentially be opened in a way that's not always uh, going to be beneficial and in line with the goals of the charter. So that's do, what I mean. Do those do those decisions say that the door has been closed, or do they say that the case is not the one that will walk through yet? No. So the, you're you're of course correct, Justice, in saying none of these cases have said the door is uh, firmly closed on an issue. But we what we submit here is that they have been so consistently refusing to fully open that door that there's a strong like we don't believe that this is also a case that goes beyond the issues at stake in those situations. Is, is there a case that's very similar to this one that you can say? Because I, 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 the reason I'm teasing this out is I, I think the door was left ajar in Gosselin. Various cases have considered walking through and have abstained. But in my understanding, most of those cases still refer to Gosselin and say, the door is still ajar. We're just waiting to see. Um, and if that's the case, I don't think there's a strong jurisprudence against positive obligations. I think there is we've yet to see the special circumstances that warrant that. And so I'm wondering if this case is those special circumstances. Is there, is there a case similar to this one relating to data collection or relating to something of that nature that, that could help me understand why it's so clear that this is not a special circumstance? You in fact open your submissions with how unique the pandemic is. And so I wonder whether or not uh, maybe this is the exact case that Gosselin was referring to. That's possible, but we submit that this is nevertheless still not the exact case that is going to continue opening that door, that, that door, apologies. And um, in particular, uh, to move on further, it's not, we submit that it's not just the positive obligation issue here that prevents a finding of a section seven violation. Um, it's the, this causal link problem that is lacking. So on a very basic level, uh, 
we have the Canada v. Bedford establishing that the claimant bears the burden of showing a sufficient causal connection between the alleged harm and the state action. So on a purely chronological causation perspective, collecting data about consequences of COVID mean that those consequences have already happened. So we can't find that the harm is caused by a data collection or non-collection of data after the fact of th that that harm has already happened. Council, now, you, course, you open your submissions with the persisting effect of the pandemic. I, I don't I don't know that I'm going to be convinced by saying some people already have COVID and so there's no harm. The, 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 I would say that Mr. Williams' claim relates to the fact that in the absence of this data, how the government will respond to the ongoing pandemic will result in harm. Um, so isn't that still uh, liable to a effective causation argument? Uh, absolutely. We understand that there's like a longer term uh, argument here as well. And in addressing that, we submit that it's, it's too remote of a, of a kind of cause and effect to meet the standard for a direct causation in this case. So essentially, if the argument is that uh, this disaggregated data could, over the longer term, support broader policy changes that could help alleviate health disparities, uh, we submit that A, two points on this, A, the extent of other actions that need to actually happen for real change to occur are so numerous and could take years and likely decades for real change to happen from collecting data properly, analyzing it properly, framing it in a policy sense, submitting it to uh, politicians and implementing policy changes whose effects will not be seen likely for years or decades afterwards. We submit it's long-term. This, this, is, this is reminding me of that shield argument that we had before, though. So it will take a, time, a long time to take information and turn it into policy. Isn't that the government's fault, right? Aren't you, aren't you essentially saying that there's so much inertia of discrimination that we now cannot hold the Canadian government to constitutional account? I don't know if I'm sympathetic to that argument. But isn't your argument, when you talked about why the, the pandemic is novel, it's not so much that it's novel and that's why this is the case to open the door, notwithstanding you know, the decades of jurisprudence, but that this isn't the time to, to go move away from deference to parliament because we are in this current crisis and that there might be cases down the road where this argument could succeed, but this isn't the right time to do it. Right. Um, we, in other words, is your argument at all hinging on the fact that we're in the pandemic and, and there's a lot going on, or is that not really an important part of your argument? That's very much uh, an important part of our argument. It's the timing of implementing these kinds of very complicated uh, changes and activities, and specifically implementing them within our provision of healthcare, which is obviously all of our pandemic related restrictions have to do with alleviating the pressure on this health system. And to add on to the earlier um, issue about you know, this kind of potentially shielding argument that's happening here with how long-term these changes can be, we also submit that the type of data being sought by the appellant in this case, specifically race-based disaggregated data, is not the right kind of uh, information that would actually affect meaningful policy change. The reason for this is because if we wanna make policy change, we need to understand the causes of racial health disparities. The causes of these disparities are not the race of an individual in and of themselves. It is socially constructed factors, um, so, so social determinants of health, like housing and employment, et cetera. So a lot of the appellant's argument relies on this idea that it's impossible for the government to implement uh, meaningful, address racial health disparities without this type of data in particular. And that because- right, it has but doesn't that argument sound a bit like we could do more it would be better if we did more, but because we can't do more, we shouldn't even do less, right? I mean, it's not like, I get that the it would be better if we had you know, intersectional data and we could do a better job of, of, of collecting race-based data, but is that really an answer for not collecting any data, any race-based data at all? We submit that it is in the sense that we already do have a sense of some of the real socially constructed causes of uh, risks to COVID-19 and the racialized nature of this risk. So I would point to, for example, a recent federal government report entitled From Risk to Resilience, an Equity Approach to COVID, where the government has explicitly recognized the socially constructed racialization of risk and noted the overrepresentation of racialized Canadians in high-risk areas like working in meat processing plants or nursing homes. So though that's a concrete example where the government already is recognizing this really problematic racialized uh, risk 
So what we submit is that this adding on this additional data collection would not actually do anything meaningful. And if the argument was that there's other policy changes or different type of data that we should collect to uh, make this kind of change, then that might be a different debate, but that's not what the appellant is seeking. The appellant in this claim is seeking race-based disaggregated data collection in particular. And we submit that that it, it would not actually solve the type of the issue that the discriminatory issue that they are uh, so, claiming. So, are you saying that the government is making policy, policy decisions on the premise that racialized Canadians are at greater risk? And, and to add to that, it sounds like what you're saying is that they're instead of tracking race, they're tracking racism. We would submit that the government is making some decisions that do acknowledge racialization of risk. Um, it was noted the priorities, prioritization of indigenous communities for vaccines, and as I mentioned, flagging high risk work environments. But what we, we submit that this case is not about whether all of the minister's policies are not- Feel free to, feel free to conclude. Okay. In the sense, um, thank you for your time, and I'll pass my. Oh no, no, I, I mean, I genuinely feel free to finish kind of, your sentence. Yeah. yeah, yeah, wrap, wrap up. Finish your thought. Yeah, don't, don't stop. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, in, in this sense, we just, we just acknowledge that if this claim was being brought uh, as a request for the minister to engage in different policies in general, or to, you know, provide more resources to this community or this neighborhood or something, that might be a different debate, but that's not what this case is about. So now I'll pass it on to my co-counsel, Olivia, to continue with her submissions. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. I'm going to present our last two doctrinal arguments, um, that the minister's decision does not infringe section 15 of the charter, and that even if the minister's decision triggered section seven or section 15 of the charter, it would still be saved under section one, as well as our last two CRT arguments that the approach suggested by the appellants is not an intersectional framework for addressing social determinants of health, and that racist aggregated data collection can exacerbate over-policing. I'm going to begin with our doctrinal argument that the absence of racist aggregated data does not infringe Section 15 of the Charter. The Section 15 test was recently reiterated in Fraser versus Canada in paragraph 27 of that case. The first prong of the test is that there must be a state law or action that creates a distinction based on enumerated or analogous grounds. The second prong of the test is that the law or action must impose a burden or deny a benefit in a way that reinforces, perpetuates, or exacerbates disadvantage. The case of Barr does not meet the Section 15 test for two reasons. First, because there's no existing benefit. Second, because the appellant has not demonstrated a sufficient causal connection between racialized health disparities and the failure to collect disaggregated race-based data. Sorry. Uh, Sorry, go, go on, Justice Garg. Yeah, I, I just before you get into those two sub points, I just want to return to Fraser in Canada, because doesn't it, broadly speaking, it, you know, broaden the government's exposure on these issues because, you know, even a facially neutral law uh, can violate the charter, meaning we always have to assess impact. It doesn't matter so much if it's government action or inaction, but rather the impact of that decision. Yes, we agree that Fraser expanded the scope for disparate, disparate impact cases under Section 15 in Canada. However, we can distinguish the case at hand from Fraser because Fraser was directly about one of those social determinants, that is to say employment. By contrast, the case at Bar is about collecting data on a particular category of people. And Fraser did not say that the importance of showing the causal link was diminished or that there was less of a need to show a strong causal link. And we submit that the appellants have failed to show this causal link because in the examples they cite of jurisdictions that have collected race disaggregated data, namely the United States and the United Kingdom, those countries have actually faced far higher rates of COVID-19 transmission and far higher rates of COVID-19 deaths than Canada has faced. So we don't believe that the appellants have shown a causal link between collecting race disaggregated data on one hand and actually having improved public health outcomes for any group of people on the other hand. Can I, can I ask you about that? Because I, I take your point that we shouldn't just take the American and UK studies and transplant them to Canada. But I thought your, your, your colleague, uh, uh, Ms. J uh, James, Council James, said that the government is accepting that 
racialized Canadians may be at greater risk and that they didn't need the data collection to do that. And they're able to still take policy decisions operating on, a, on almost a presumption that they're at greater risk because they're in more dense neighborhoods, for example. Um, so, I mean, you can't really have it both ways, right? I mean, are you accepting that racialized Canadians are at greater risk of contracting COVID-19? We are accepting that racialized Canadians are at greater risk of contracting COVID-19, but we would argue that the data collection itself does not necessarily lead to governments implementing ameliorative policies to address this issue, which be we believe right. was the issue with the US and the UK jurisdictions. So as my co-counsel said um, in her submissions, one of the reasons the COVID-19 crisis is unprecedented is because of the strain that it's put on government resources and in particular on the healthcare system. So given that we already accept that there are racial health disparities in Canada, and given that we have incredibly scarce resources, we submit that it's better to put those resources towards direct measures such as contact tracing and vaccine distribution, um, and towards directly addressing social determinants of health, for example, by improving housing and providing more options for secure and socially distant housing, rather than waiting to spend the time and the financial resources on the data collection itself when it's not necessary for us to take those direct actions. So council, I want to, um, I've just been spinning through Fraser here. So one of your arguments, as I understand it, is that the appellants have not met the causation standard required for section 15. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And so at paragraph 70, the majority in Fraser says, if claimants successfully demonstrate that a law has a disproportionate impact on members of a protected group, they need not independently prove that the protected characteristic caused the disproportionate impact. So I read Fraser as, as jettisoning causation as being required in and of itself in relation to section 15. Is, so can you help me with this argument? Yes, so in this case, if the claimants had successfully demonstrated that the law had a disproportionate impact, um, they would not need to prove that the personal characteristic was the cause of the impact. But I can, I believe that we can distinguish it from the case the appellants actually made um, in this situation. Because no one is disputing that the cause of racial health disparities is related to racism. That's something that both sides in this case will acknowledge. However, what the appellants have not proved is that specifically um, the decision not to collect race disaggregated data and to instead prioritize resources on other measures was the cause of the systemic racism and was the cause of the racial health disparities facing Black Canadians. So you're saying it's, it's other manifestations of structural racism are what have contributed to disparate COVID-19 infection, but not data collection. No, we believe that the primary causes um, are likely to be, like my co-counsel mentioned, the fact that racialized people are more likely to work in high-risk environments, are more likely to work jobs where it's difficult for them to work from home, are more likely to live in high density housing, et cetera. Sorry, I, I may have misspoke. That, that's what I meant. That this uh, other forms of structural racism are, are what's actually causing the distribution. It's not um, uh, not the data collection. That, that makes sense. I understand what you're saying. Yes. Um, to move forward with the section 15 arguments, um, we believe firstly that there's no existing benefit so the appellants admit that the government already collects disaggregated database on gender and age. But as my co-counsel distinguished, the government doesn't have a questionnaire that's offered at the point of healthcare service to ask people their age or ask people their gender, for example, when they're getting COVID tested. Instead, this information is collected already by provincial healthcare providers and by provincial health insurance when people register with those providers and for that insurance. So that's why, um, the government already has access to that information. We believe that the questionnaire method proposed by the appellants is incredibly problematic for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because while in paragraph 21 of their factum, they claim that it would pose no real hindrance to the minister, we believe there would be a massive cost of creating and maintaining this type of national database, as well as the human cost of gathering information and having personnel to analyze, organize, and consolidate that information. But furthermore, we'd note that the federal government does not require disaggregated data collection based on other grounds such as sexual orientation or religion. The appellants admit that race is analogous to gender in this case because they're both 
complex elements of identity. However, we believe that we should be critical of how provincial healthcare providers collect information on gender. So we actually agree that the binary and simplistic way that gender data is often collected is frequently bad for trans and non-binary people. And if we recognize that's a problem in how the government collects data collection, um, it's not the right time to force the government to keep collecting data in this way, in a way that's likely to um, negatively impact other marginalized groups. And that's something that should occur with proper consultation um, in a time when the government can devote more resources to doing it properly. Are you, are you suggesting that maybe there's actually a claim here in the opposite direction, that perhaps there could be a successful discrimination claim on the basis of your current collecting of gender data? Um, I won't say too much about that, but we do believe that that would be more likely to succeed than the current claim brought by the appellants. In any um, event, it, it just goes to show why these are the kind of balancing decisions that are best suited to the government. Yes, we completely agree. Um, there are several issues with the appellant's arguments regarding um, parliamentary deference and changing parliamentary deference. First of all, they assume that courts will be more sympathetic to racial minorities than, the, than parliament will. However, we recognize that with the possible exception of the Diversity High Court of Canada, the judiciary in Canada is overwhelmingly white for the same reasons of systemic racism that the Parliament of Canada is also overwhelmingly white. We, but we see that the difference is that the government actually has more flexibility in listening to and accommodating racial minorities because they have the ability to use tools like consultation with communities because they have access to institutional expertise and data collection tools and so on um, that the courts don't have. We'd also say that a difference is that governments are more directly accountable to people. So even though the majority of Canada is white because of how um, racialization is distributed among different communities, racialized communities are still successful in some cases at electing racialized representatives who can advocate for the unique interests of their communities. And we don't see that there's an equivalent to that in the judiciary where judges are appointed after um, a very long process. But isn't one of the ways in which we hold the government accountable through constitutional challenges? Yes, we hold the government accountable through constitutional challenges, but these constitutional challenges are meant to simply implement the previous rules and to make sure that the government is acting consistently with what previous case law and what the wording of legislation tells us. Um, and we think... Sir, Council, are you saying that the... Uh government should be left to deal with these issues of discrimination because the government is more diverse than the judiciary? I just wanna make sure I understand your argument. Well, we think that unfortunately, neither the government nor the judiciary are incredibly diverse. We believe that the government has additional tools and additional points of access um, for the general population and for racialized communities that make it slightly better suited to make policy decisions around discrimination than the courts. And so in the case at hand where it's actually a complex decision about resource allocation and not about whether we address systemic racism or not, but which way is a better way to address systemic racism. For example, is it better to address it through disaggregated race-based data collection or is it better to address it through directly addressing social determinants of health? So for example, how the government has created funds to supplement lost income, um, which is a social determinant. Um, for those reasons, we believe that we should maintain deference to Parliament in cases such as the one at hand. So, uh, Council, I, I appreciate the argument that you're making, and I, but for the text of Section 15.1, I think I could agree with you. But when you say that the government is better positioned to uh, address issues of discrimination, maybe they even are, but if Section 15 says that the government is scrutinized by courts in relation to literally the word discrimination, how do you get around that? We can't defer to the government on discrimination when courts are constitutionally instructed to scrutinize the government for discrimination. I believe, um, firstly, that the wording of section 15 is perhaps problematic in and of itself because it doesn't take into account those factors which might make the government um, more accountable than the courts to racialized communities. Um, are you arguing that it would actually be better if there weren't any equality provisions in the charter because the government is more likely to be progressive than the courts? 
I believe that there should be equality provisions in the charter, but that given the balance of power between the governments and the courts, um, it should be the courts who owe deference to the government and not the other way around, because they each have unique benefits in terms of how they can interpret and implement law. But as I mentioned before, the government has additional tools and a couple additional forms of accountability to racialized communities. Um, I'm now going to move on to our argument um, about section one of the charter. So we submit that the case at bar does not trigger section seven or section 15 of the charter, but even if it did, it would be saved under section one. Under the RV Oaks framework, justification under section one requires three elements. First, that the limit on charter rights be prescribed by law. Second, that there be a pressing and substantial legislative objective. Third, that the means be proportional to that objective. Firstly, the pressing and substantial objective. So we submit that protecting the health of Canadians is a pressing and substantial objective given the effects of COVID-19 and its high transmission rate. It's also in line with the minister's statutory objectives under the Department of Health Act of the promotion and preservation of the health of the people of Canada. Right, so I don't think there's any debate that dealing with COVID is a pressing and substantial objective and that and that, that would obviously always uh, satisfy that part of a section one analysis. But don't you need to show how the decision to not collect race-based data is a substantial, pressing and substantial objective. And I guess I'd ask, what is the objective? Yes, so the minister's decision not to collect race-based data was not just in itself a decision to do nothing. The decision rather was to prioritize direct measures and prioritize addressing social determinants of health. Um, as I mentioned before, through things like improving housing security and through income supplements, rather than focusing on data collection during this unprecedented and urgent time. And You're asking we, us to broaden our view, to not look at it the way the appellant wants, which is just focus on, on, on race uh, data collection vis-a-vis -vis COVID, but the government's overall response to COVID and whether there's discrimination in that overall response? Yes, exactly. We submit that, mm -hmm. unfortunately, every government's resources are limited. And while this may not come into play in every court case, given the extreme strain that the COVID-19 pandemic has put on all governments and all economies, um, the limited resources and the limited means of the Canadian government are unfortunately something the court um, should take notice of in this particular situation. Oh, is this a means issue? Like. Collecting the race-based data, is that some, is it really the government's absence of finances that's, that's causing the, is the reason that you're not doing it? I believe it's both the absence of finances um, as well as the absence of personnel to implement this type of data collection program. Um, so as an example, as of December 2020, so about a month ago, the federal government had already spent over $200 billion on these types of direct measures to address COVID-19. Um, and we also see that in cases, so for example, in Montreal, um, the healthcare system is incredibly strained and hospitals are reaching their maximum capacity, not because they lack the space to put patients, but because they don't have enough personnel to man these institutions. And so at this time, adding additional duties and creating additional barriers, such as having to train healthcare personnel and how to collect this data, having to assemble a team to create a questionnaire and to decide how race is going to be delineated within this questionnaire, um, creating teams and of cybersecurity experts and data collection experts to maintain this national database and consolidate data on a national level. Those are things the government unfortunately doesn't have the resources for at the time. What is the ceiling of this deference in relation to prioritization? If the, if the Canadian government said most transmission is happening in cities. So the vaccines are only going to be sent to cities for the first year. No one in rural communities, no one in the North. Um, would that be an acceptable prioritization by the Canadian government? We submit that that would not be an acceptable prioritization by the Canadian government because while the virus has disproportionately impacted people in cities. There are also unique challenges faced by people in rural communities. So for example, there might be lower community transmission, but it may be harder for them to access large health centers that have cutting edge technology. But, so, but, who, but who would we as a court be to intervene in that judgment? If the government through its various consultations decided that 
because of skyrocketing trans right you just mentioned montreal they said because of skyrocketing transmission rates in cities we're only going to send vaccines there not because they think there's no problem in the north or in rural communities but because based on the consultation they've done and the research they've done and the exercise of their expertise that cities are the place where it's most significantly happening how would we as a court intervene based on your arguments relating to expertise yes so the difference between this hypothetical scenario and the one at hand is that in this hypothetical scenario, governments have completely abandoned the interest of people in rural nor and northern communities. However, in the case at Barr, we see that the government hasn't overlooked the effects of systemic racism. Rather, the government has chosen an alternative method to deal with systemic racism. And we believe that in cases where the government completely neglects or ignores the interest of one minority group, the courts should intervene. However, we believe in cases where there are two possible ways to address systemic racism, for example, through either data collection or through prioritizing addressing social determinants. That is a case um, where the courts owe deference to parliament. Um, so in conclusion, the appellants are seeking a massive reallocation of resources at a time when Canada doesn't have these resources. The order they seek will take resources away from direct measures and put them towards data collection instead. However, they haven't shown what race-based medicine would look like once the status collection is completed. They haven't shown how this data collection would be conducted or analyzed the resource demand that this would place on the federal government during the crisis. Now is not the right time for race disaggregated data collection and the federal government is not the right actor. For these reasons, we request that the appeal be dismissed without cost. In the alternative, we request that any order for race-based data collection be suspended until the COVID-19 pandemic has ended. Thank you. Council, can I ask you one more question, uh, even though you're sort out of time? Because you, you didn't get a chance, I don't think, you ran out of time to deal with the CRT argument number three, right? The over-policing and surveillance of racialized communities. Yes. But I want to ask, because we have your fact, and we'll, and we'll, we'll look at that in our deliberations, but um, I, I did want to ask you one question about that. Um, you talk a lot about the misuse, right? That if you were to collect this data, it could lead to police, uh, for example, using it in an improper manner. But should we really be not collecting data or, or taking actions because there could be misuse later on? I mean, aren't our courts equipped to deal with misuse when it occurs. And so if there is misuse, hopefully the police will deal with it. But if not, then a, a lawyer will represent an individual and, and bring that to the court's attention at that point. Yes, we have three main responses to this issue. So first, due to the resource demand again, we believe that there are sufficient financial and personnel resources to devote to cybersecurity at this time to make sure the data is securely stored. Secondly, although courts are an option once the breach of data has occurred, because there can be a lack of transparency in the use of data by state actors, um, the individuals involved may not know that the data breach has occurred. They may not know that that's why they're being targeted or profiled by police. And then even if they are able to go to court, it would require massive resources and massive legal costs to do so. And it, because trials and appellate advocacy can take years, it may be a long time before they seek, see any recourse or resolution to those issues. Um, and third, although we would hope, we would certainly want to live in a world where they could report the data breach to the police to, to seek recourse, it's sometimes the police themselves who are breaching this confidential data um, and who are using it to target racialized people. So I, there's an example in our factum where the Canadian Civil Liberties Association recently flagged a case where police had improperly accessed a COVID-19 database and they had used it for purposes other than its original public health purpose, which is why participants had believed their data was collected. Thanks for addressing that. 